Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on scenario-based education. I'm your host for the webinar, Danielle. At CareerCert, we are focused on providing emergency and healthcare professionals with the training they need to best protect and care for their communities. And we're so grateful for this opportunity to connect with you today. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters for this webinar, Kelly Kirk and David Robertson. Kelly Kirk is the president and CEO of 911 eLearning Solutions. He has been an active paramedic since 1994 and has been developing EMS courses since 2000. He is recognized throughout North Carolina as a pioneer in online learning for emergency services. In his quest to improve distance education as a whole, he has served on and with multiple state level community, committees and organizations. Received a master's degree in instructional design for online learning and is nearing completion of his PhD in instructional design for online learning. David Robertson is a photographer, videographer, voiceover artist, and musician who has been developing e learning content with 911 e learning solutions since 2017. He is based in High Point, North Carolina, and studied at UNC Greensboro's School of Media Studies. Now I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you, Kelly and David. Wow, thank you. Uh, that was an awesome introduction. That saves us a little bit of stuff. Welcome, everybody. Um, like she said, uh, my name is Kelly, and uh, these are our ugly faces. That's the best you're going to get out of us. So thank you very much. Um, we appreciate the introduction. We look forward to uh, going through the uh, this next 45, 55 minutes with you. Um, the session we're going to cover today is uh, we're talking about scenario-based education. And uh, our goal is to provide evidence-based education on the use of scenario-based educational practices. So we'll cover uh, several different things uh, today, including uh, defining and describing the scenario-based education, what it is, we'll explain uh, why it works, identify different reasons for why you would use uh, scenario-based education. We've got some tips and hopefully some resources that might help you if uh, you're interested in creating your own scenario-based education and then share some uh, best practices. So before we get too far into it, it's, I always like to know who is here. So if you don't mind, uh, take a moment and uh, complete the survey. I think uh, Danielle's getting ready to launch that for you. Uh, when it comes up, if you would uh, complete the survey, we'll give you a minute here to do that. Okay, and uh, I apologize. We're this is the first time we've done uh, worked with Danielle. Danielle, will it share with us when everybody's completed, or um, how does that work? I'll go ahead and share the results right now. Oh, wonderful! Good. We got a, a nice group. Looks like most folks are training, uh, dealing with training. That's outstanding. Okay, and one more quick survey. Question is, why are you here? There's a couple of good ones in here. Um, they made me do it. Those are always some of my favorites. Um, somebody said there would be beer. Yes, there will be beer. I promise you beer. Okay, here come those results. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And there we go. All right. Uh, it looks like we've got one or two that wants a beer, maybe. <laughs> All right, let's get started. One last thing uh, to talk about. I do want to uh, provide a quick disclaimer. We do have an, uh, a partnership with CareerCert. Uh, we develop uh, online 
uh, courses and uh, some scenarios for them as well. Uh, but I promise I'm not going to make this a sales pitch. It's not what this is all about. It's about trying to get you the education uh, that uh, we can provide for you. And also we have uh, an agreement with iSimulate. Uh, they provide us with uh, some pretty good uh, software to for some of our simulations. We do not have a financial any type of financial agreement or anything with iSimulate. They just provide us with software that we use. So I want to get that out there so that everybody knows we're not here for a sales pitch. We want to try and share some information with you. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the buzzwords that you'll hear uh, with scenario-based education. And uh, those are problem-based learning, authentic learning, immersive learning. Um, you'll also hear immersive learning simulations. That's probably the most uh, accurate uh, term that's there. Uh, active learning, conceptual learning, there's several different uh, concepts and theories that are in here as well. I try not to uh, make things too academic and theory based, just want to share some of the knowledge that we have and uh, some of the benefits that we've gained from the education that we've had. So moving along. So what is scenario-based education? Well, scenario-based education is student-centered. It is uh, a device that uses situated cognition that through simulation is used to create immersive authentic learning experiences. It is engaging, it immerses the learners into uh, the, the training, and it is something that we will find is enjoyable and the studies have shown that it's very, very effective. Okay. Uh, Scenario-based education also allows the learners to directly participate inside these simulated situations, as Kelly said previously. It creates a, a safe and controlled environment that learners can uh, just basically get these experiences that otherwise they would have to get on the job in the real world. Um, in these situations, they're free to explore and engage in all these concepts that they're trying to learn. Um, they're also encouraged to make mistakes to uh, help solidify the concepts that we try to teach them. And this, in turn, helps them to prevent similar errors in real life. Uh, we can do this through providing them with re real, meaningful feedback. Okay, so... When it comes down to it, a good way to describe scenario-based education, uh, according to Dr. Uh, Ruth Colvin Clark, um, it is basically job experience in a box. Uh, the learner can enter a simulated true-to-life environment and make free, they have the freedom to make whatever choices they want to, uh, within reason, of course. Um, why does scenario-based education work? Uh, well, it's can by immersing a learner in um, realistic situations that are true to life this in turn can increase engagement engagement then increases the transfer of learning which is when a learner applies concepts that they learn to new contexts um, and the more immersive a scenario can be the more authentic it's going to feel to the learner um, and by being more authentic, it's going to lead to more contextualization and retention of the concepts that the learner is trying to learn. So as I have liked to say, I have a little term I call Kellyology, and it's just the way I like to look at things. I like to, whenever you see me do Kellyology, that is something exceptionally simple. I try to break it down as simple as possible. So to sum up basically what David just said, it's not death by PowerPoint that we are all so used to. It is something that learners enjoy, and by the way, they actually remember more when you do scenario-based education. Very well said. Um, one thing that really applies to scenarios is the idea of making choices, having the freedom to make these choices in this environment that we're trying to uh, instruct them in. Um, this is related to something in the study of games, also known as ludology. Uh, there's a theory called player agency, which is the ability for a player of a game to meaningfully change the course of their experience, objectively through uh, tangible effects, and also subjectively through how much control they see themselves to have. Um, even though scenario-based learning isn't exactly a game, the concept is very similar. 
the learner has to feel that they have adequate and realistic control over the decisions in the scenario and that their decisions make an appreciable difference in the world of the scenario itself. Um, on the same page from making decisions, the most valuable lessons we can learn come from mistakes. So in our scenarios and in scenario-based learning in general, the learner needs to be encouraged to make mistakes and try again. And whenever they make a, uh, make a mistake, they need to receive uh, concrete, adequate feedback about the choice they've made, why it is incorrect. And a little more Kellyology, it's more enjoyable is what is all about the scenarios. Also to uh, continue what David's saying about mistakes, uh, we've all made mistakes along the way. Some of the best lessons in life have been where we have made mistakes and learned from them. So that's the purpose of the scenario-based education is that we provide them with the ability to make those mistakes and making the mistakes sometimes can be fun. It depends on how you set the scenarios up and uh, what you're doing with them. Indeed. Um, something else that helps uh, scenario-based education to really succeed is contextualization of concepts. Um, uh, a learner's readiness to learn is increased when the learning relates direct, rela uh, excuse me, relates directly to the knowledge requ uh, required in the real world. Uh, pretty much, if a learner is able to uh, excuse me, contextualize the real world benefit from training, they're more likely to push beyond their comfort zones and explore cognitive boundaries. Um, this allows for experimentation, improvisation, uh, a more complete understanding of the concepts being taught but it also helps contextualize new knowledge by showing them how it matters in an authentic example. Um, this can also be more challenging and really spur a learner on to um, be more active. That it does. And again, uh, the way that I say that is what scenario-based education does is it lets them know why and how they do what they want, what they're doing. Uh, as you learn in adult learning theory, uh, what's called andragogy. Adults need to know and they want to know how things fit together. They don't do well with just being told this is the way things are. So doing scenarios helps them to understand how things fit together. That's the contextualization that he's talking about. And scenarios give you the opportunity to see that. The other reason scenario works is it increases confidence. It helps learners understand that the situations that they have been put through through school and whether it's in a classroom or whether you're prepping them for oral boards or it's a new hire that you're bringing onto the, the system, it helps them understand that they know what they're doing and it definitely increases their confidence. And as you can see by our uh, student here, he started off thinking he was Superman and by the end of the session, he thought he was a doctor and we all know those folks. So for us in medical providers, uh, we know that critical thinking skills are exceptionally important. It's uh, being a paramedic is part of, part being a detective and trying to determine what's going on and through working scenarios that allows the learner to act as the primary caregiver for this patient and make the decisions based on what they find and the assessments that they perform. So when they do that, they make the decisions and they need to be allowed to see the consequences of those decisions. And those are, again, the best learning experiences that you can provide because it lets the learner know that if you give this medication, you can probably expect this side effect if you give it too quickly or whatever the case is. And uh, by doing that, again, uh, giving them the opportunity to make the mistakes and increase the their critical thinking skills is uh, really important with the scenario based. So especially in e-learning scenarios, when you build, build those, uh, they are very important because they afford the learner the opportunity to provide them with uh, those making those mistakes. They get the substantive 
feedback. It's constructive feedback that we try to provide with them. And uh, when you do online, especially the online uh, scenarios that we build, you get the opportunity to think through all the mistakes that they may make and provide them with a consistent feedback that each learner is going to uh, receive as you move forward. So the other benefit of scenario-based education is that you're able to put them in a safe and controlled environment. And working EMS, we know that uh, the environment that we put our learners into uh, at times can become exceptionally dangerous. So uh, using scenarios, you can create those dangerous environments in a safe environment, if that makes sense at all, and allows you to, uh, uh, it helps increase the learning effectiveness. The learners, uh, studies have shown that learners learn better when they feel safe and the uh, in the environment that they're in, especially when they're psychologically safe. So by providing them with a safe environment and putting them in scenarios where they feel safe, it will allow them the ability to make those decisions and again, learn from those decisions. Uh, it's not just safety also uh, that helps increase learner retention and satisfaction. Um, Scenario-based based education increases uh, learning retention among learners in general and just results in greater satisfaction with the actual learning experience. So basically, if you're trying to teach a concept to somebody, it will almost always be more effective and they will walk away with it feeling more confident about their acquired skills if it's delivered through a scenario. Another benefit of uh, scenario-based education is you can provide them with the high-risk, low-frequency events uh, that you can simulate, uh, things such as your difficult airways, uh, surgical crikes, things that are um, run that they don't get a lot of experience on. And especially as training officers, you, uh, through scenarios, uh, that's pretty much the bread and butter of training officers and being able to evaluate somebody's ability to get the cognitive knowledge to their hands and uh, function. Uh, it's a really good way to assess somebody's cognitive ability too. So um, with the scenario-based education, again, you're able to recreate those high impact skills that uh, unfortunately they just don't get a whole bunch of experience with. And not only do we uh, do scenarios allow learners to get these uh, rare events basically in experience form, um, it also allows them to get them consistently. Uh, on the job training or on the actual on the job experience, um, clinical rotations, um, various learning through internships and apprent apprenticeships, all that learning can be random, it can be subject to chance. The actual event has to happen for the learner to be able to learn from it. Um, so scenarios can give an educator um, the ability to focus on these specific things at the time they choose. So instead of having to wait for a specific event to happen, the instructor can just give it to the learner whenever they choose, whenever they want to. Uh, this can also happen more quickly. That is absolutely true. And we all know those people that we call the white clouds and the black clouds. Those are the students that, or the learners that go into clinical rotations and they may work an eight hour, 12 hour rotation and run 12 or 14 calls that are just unbelievable and get a tremendous amount of experience. Now, those of us with experience on the truck and have spent time running those calls, we don't like to see those students walk through the door because we know we're getting ready to get really, really busy. But then, the benefit from that is those people got that experience, whereas the white clouds that come in and may work an entire 12, 24 hour shift and pretty much wash the ambulance and maybe go pick somebody up out of the floor, they don't get the clinical experience that they, they really need. They get to see what one, work, one part of EMS is about, but they don't get that real the real reason they're there, and that's to get their hands on the patients and get the experience and the engagement. So with a scenario, you can provide them with that. You can focus that in and help expedite somebody's 
education through um, getting them the scenarios that are, like David said, they're directed at specific objectives. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but uh, scenarios can also take less time to complete in general. Um, what can happen in a scenario is you can compress and control time. Uh, this allows actions that aren't strictly part of the objective at hand to be condensed down to whatever time you as an educator chooses. Um, the learner or the educator can slow down or speed up time as necessary, and this keeps the focus and uh, engagement of the learner on the identified objectives so that they're not distracted by however long something has to take. So there are several different types of scenarios. Now, most of what you've seen uh, so far, we've talked a little bit about the virtual scenarios, but there's low fidelity scenarios. Those are the most common. You see those all the time where uh, it can be as simple as somebody just a, an oral board. Uh, others are uh, the more high fidelity scenarios that are super uh, popular right now with the simulations and uh, those where uh, many different agencies, especially your educational institutions, have the sim labs and those things. Uh, then there's also the virtual scenarios. And again, uh, we'll show some of the ones that, uh, that we've been working on. Um, low fidelity scenarios have a couple of, of advantages and disadvantages. Um, the main advantage is they're very inexpensive to produce. Uh, they can also be developed very quickly, uh, sometimes just in time for a specific event. Um, they're also very easily customizable. You can change a low fidelity uh, scenario quickly on the fly if you need to. As Kelly said, um, an oral board is a good example of this. Another good example of it is a simple written question that just sets up what uh, a, a small scenario, um, you have a patient in this specific situation, what do you do? However, a disadvantage of these low fidelity scenarios is they're not very immersive. Um, the learner isn't surrounded by things that would make them feel like they're really there. So it's very easy for them to not pay as much attention to the concepts as we would perhaps like. So one of this, uh, We've covered several of those examples. Uh, simple oral board scenarios are uh, common. That's probably the most common scenario that you deal with. Uh, then you can increase the fidelity of them as you go in the classroom, as you can see here with the uh, the group of students around a mannequin. Uh, you can also add actors in as the patients, uh, as you see on the top right there, where we had a, another student performing as the the patient that increases the engagement increases the the fidelity of uh, what's going on uh, as compared to some of the others that are out there but most those are the most simple to do and uh, most of us if not all of us have actually been through those and even uh, administered them to other people and the more fidelity you get uh, you do get some extra advantages and likewise disadvantages um, advantages are that obviously the, the learner is going to be more immersed they're going to feel like they're more actually there in the situation in the moment um, high fidelity scenarios can often be more impactful with better long-term retention rates um, however they are very expensive to produce especially compared to low fidelity scenarios um, it takes a lot longer to develop uh, the scenario in general, and there are staffing limits to them also. Like you would have to potentially bring in other personnel to be actors in a way. Yes, and uh, some of those other staffing limits that uh, we talk about are uh, when you're dealing with some of these real high fidelity at, uh, labs actually have full-time employees. Uh, to to run them. I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to work in work in or with some of those labs, but you can't just go in and start running a scenario in there because there's extensive amounts of training to know how to input the scenario and get it to to come out right. So there's a lot of time and, and energy that goes into them. Again, they're exceptionally immersive and they're very impactful. Uh, that is uh, some of the best education that we can provide. But unfortunately, like I said, it is expensive and there's definitely the staffing limits. 
So some of those examples include your, your uh, high-end uh, medical labs, the simulation labs. You can create the scenario in-house and the more high fidelity is simply in, in this particular case, as you can see in the uh, picture in the top right where you've got the two paramedics and then you've got multiple actors that are there. You've got actually got moulaged patients that are there. They've Everybody's been coached as to what should happen, how, how things should progress. The patients know exactly how they should respond. So that's still considered a high fidelity scenario because you're providing them with multiple multi-sensory uh, addressing you're addressing multiple senses and uh, one other to uh, mention is uh, things like i simulate where uh, and they're not the only company that pro provides those types of of tools where you can incorporate those but uh, those again are some really good examples to use and then finally we got, finally we got uh, virtual scenarios um we've already discussed them but previously uh and they likewise have their own advantages and disadvantages um virtual scenarios can bridge the gap between low fidelity and high fidelity scenarios but they can just they can be just as immersive um advantages are that um they're consistent very consistent um every single time you run the scenario it's going to be the same so it's very it's it's good to to be able to get a feel for how effective your training is if you're trying to send it to a wider audience. Um, they can be given anytime, anywhere, so it's completely asynchronous. You don't have to have a specific uh, educator to be running the scenario or uh, watching over the learners to make sure that they're getting what they need to out of it. Um, it saves money. It's not as expensive uh, as a high fidelity scenario is to create, and you don't have to worry about overtime pay. Uh, all this, all these scenarios can be completed while uh, someone is currently on duty. Um, they're friendly on mobile devices. You can run a lot of these virtual scenarios on a phone in most cases. Um, and they're more immersive than low fidelity by allowing you to include uh, different uh, media objects. We can include audio, video, still images. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in virtual scenarios for that. And learners can also complete the lesson as many times as they want to. They're perpetually repeatable. Uh, if a learner goes through a scenario and they feel like they didn't quite get everything out of it that they wanted to, they can always go back again and again. Uh, the disadvantages are that um, there are connection speed limitations, especially in rural areas. Um, also, there can be a high learning curve. It's mm, some people just don't do well with digital interfaces. So they're not for everybody. Okay. Now, um, how exactly are the learners drawn into a scenario? The learner it becomes an actor. They assume the role of a professional in whatever the scenario calls for. Um, they gather information and make meaningful decisions that may affect the outcome of the scenario. Um, by stepping into the role of a professional role, excuse me, uh, they can basically be given this opportunity to get this job experience for virtually no detriment. So how do we create immersion? And we talked a little bit about that uh, by uh, one way is to add multiple senses and include multiple senses. Make things realistic. And I don't know if uh, we may have passed the, the quote earlier, but um, studies have shown that it's it's not as much about how, how high the fidelity is as to how realistic the scenario is and how they're able to tie it to real concepts that's what's more important it's not the fidelity the fidelity adds to it but it's more important that it is a very realistic scenario and something that is uh, believable for for the learner so you can include multiple senses uh, again as you can see in, in this image there's moulage you've got actors that are there uh, the patient is uh, performing as he should uh, obviously there's not audio here but um, there is uh, the the patient is is yelling the family members of the people that are around there are yelling adding the the extra um 
audio connection or the audio uh, to it as well. Now we've got a little video and let me see here. Give me a second. I'll get it. I apologize. And this video is uh, shows you an example of a uh, an online or a virtual scenario that that we built and how we were able to make it immersive. So it should be coming up now. second I'll bring us back up here so as you can see in that video uh, there's uh, what we did with that was tried to make it as realistic as possible and we've all been in those environments where you're trying to hear lung sounds and you've got music playing or there's family going on or there's extrication equipment going on around you and that allows us the opportunity to try to include those those additional senses to make the the scenario real for the for the learner now as kelly said before um, the level of fidelity is not directly correlated to the level of immersion that a student can feel um, a good way to get around this is to use narrative techniques um, narrative structure and techniques um, are often very, very valuable, not just in uh, education, but in everyday life, because we are social animals. We enjoy to tell stories about our experiences. And more often than not, if you hear a story about something, you're often going to remember the context and even the content uh, more readily. Um, you can use vivid imagery to describe locations and objects. You can help paint the exact picture of the scenario in the mind of the learner. And uh, this can be reinforced by appropriate images and sound. Again, not necessary for uh, immersion, but every little bit helps. Um, you can use second person present tense to make the learner feel like they're actually in the situation. Now, second person present is instead of saying, he walked to the bar, you say, you walk to the bar. Um, it's very direct. It uh, makes makes the action feel like it's happening right now. It's immediate. Um, this helps uh, the occurrences in the world, uh, just uh, like I said, feel like they're actually going on. They're going on right now. And it makes the learner feel like they're actually here, like they're actually there. Um, you can also use narrative hooks and cliffhangers to grab the learner's attention and create dramatic tension. Um, this has uh, a benefits. It also has detriments depending on the context. But if you have a uh, a cliffhanger that say we introduce a patient or who, a, a prospective patient who is in a car accident, we describe the car accident and then move to something else. So in a way that creates this tension of are they going to be okay? What? How bad is it actually going to be once I arrive on scene? And uh, yeah, there are benefits to that. Uh, also, you can create detailed characters to really immerse uh, the learner in a world. Um, it's 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 really important whenever you include a character in a scenario to make sure that they are realistic and 
realistic means that they're going to talk in a way that makes sense logically depending on who they are, what their background is, what their level of education is, um, whether or not they're antagonistic or friendly towards the learner. And you can use these, um, these relationships to help build immersion even more than you could previously. Um, this creates almost like an intrinsic motivation in a way, because a lot of learners um, specifically, they're, they're not in the edge, like learners are uh, extrinsically motivated or intrinsic, excuse me, intrinsically motivated um, by education often just because they want to get the qualification for whatever it is they're trying to learn. However, a scenario can create an extra level of extrinsic motivation that basically creates a drive to complete the education that would not have been there otherwise. Um, so as I said, using narrative techniques, you can very richly describe uh, locations, objects, actions, characters, um, and also provide uh, students with a realistic uh, setup and problem. Uh, the two examples we have here is we have just uh, uh, a description of a station, uh, and it says at your station, you're tidying up after lunch. So you're getting a sense of what you're doing at the current moment, who your partner is, and kind of what the station looks like in general. Um, this just gets the learner a little bit more into the world that we're trying to, 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 to instruct them in. Um, something else that's uh, important here is um, you don't want to be too brief. Instead of saying your patient is a 45-year-old male complaining of uh, shortness of breath, you instead would be better off being a bit more floral with it, a bit more um, descriptive. So instead of just saying your patient's a 45-year-old male complaining of shortness of breath, you say you're responding to a shortness of breath call. You pull down a long driveway that leads to a large colonial-style home surrounded by trees and a well-manicured lawn. There's a large cobblestone walkway aligned with flowers that lead you to the seven steps up to an immaculate front porch. The concerned-looking middle-aged female meets you at the door in a robe and slippers. And then she tells you he's up here as she hurries up the grand uh, staircase behind her. Uh, at the top of the stairs, you hear the distinct hum of the oxygen concentrator connected to the cross-country uh, tubing aligning the hallway. See, that really paints a picture of what the learner should be seeing. And this is something that doesn't have to be done in writing. It can be done in uh, in person. Absolutely. And one of the things that has uh, stood out to me was one of the last oral boards I did uh, a couple of years ago with our medical director. And I can still see the image of the house that I painted, that he painted. And it was simply an oral board. And at first, I, I didn't quite understand because it was it was abnormal for me to sit in an oral board where the medical director gives you such detail. But now, after some additional study, and it, it's impressive to see that I, my mind painted the picture, and I could see exactly what that looked like. And he never gave me details of the colors of the house or any of that stuff, but they were specific details about turning down a hallway and there's a piano that's blocking the the doorway and those kind of things. So it's really important in uh, painting that picture by immersing them as much as you can. And, and just a simple oral scenario can do that. So the question is, uh, how do we do that? And how do we design these? So in designing the scenario-based education it's like any other education the you we use the addy model um, which is analyze design develop implement and evaluate so in the very beginning of it what we're going to do is we're going to identify the objectives and you want to keep the 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 objective that you're trying to accomplish with that scenario you want to keep it uh, fairly focused so you don't get too broad you also, uh, once you get the focus of the scenario together, you know what, what it is you're trying to accomplish, then you start designing it and you come up with the scenario that will meet the objectives that will have the learner go through whatever it is. If you're, if you're trying to get them to perform a surgical cricothyrotomy, that's the objective that you want to meet. Then you write the scenario that is a realistic scenario that would put them into that situation where they're going to have to do that. And so with that, you 
also want to go in and build the rationale, the, the feedback for why you want them to make certain decisions. This works really well in uh, the virtual scenarios. It also helps in your traditional scenarios, especially if you're going to, uh, if you are a training officer for some of the large agencies where you may have multiple people, field training officers and other folks that do the scenarios for you. It helps provide consistency by having the scenario written out and the specific uh, objectives and goals written for them and the feedback that you want them to get that helps uh, provide that consistency that you want. And then it just becomes, you start developing it and it's based on the budget that you have. Uh, you want to remember to address as many senses as you can to try and make it as immersive as possible. But keep in mind that what's most important is that it is a realistic scenario that they can find themselves in. That's what what's the probably the most important thing uh, to remember from that. So the next step is you implement it. You give your scenario out, You whether you're doing it yourself or you're passing it on to field training officers or whomever, and you run your folks through it. Let them uh, do this work through the scenario. Well, then you evaluate it. You go back and a couple of different evaluation levels uh, you want to look at are um, the learner enjoyment. Did they enjoy the scenario? Did it make sense to them? How engaging was it to them? Did they uh, engage in the content? Did they engage in the in the uh, the scenario itself? And then, uh, as typical, you want to engage the learning. Did they learn? Did they meet the objective that you were trying to uh, achieve? Then, once you get that information, you can go back and tweak it and make it better or dis uh, completely rewrite it if you need to. So, scenario-based education works. It's like coffee. We are all paramedics who like coffee and scenarios are, um, they're consistent, they are focused, they are much more friendly for the learners than the stand and deliver dry eyes guy. Uh, you also uh, keep in mind that they are expedient. You can move them along quicker. You can compress time if you need to. You can stretch time if you need to. They provide relevant experience and just-in-time experience when they need it. So in summary, scenarios work. The literature is loaded with information that supports the benefits of scenario-based education. Uh, it increases learner retention. It improves learning outcomes. Learners enjoy it more, and, it, and learners that enjoy the scenarios will come back. And that is what you're looking for as a training officer. You're looking for people that enjoy doing what they do. Today's society, we're getting away from the education of the past where it was the sage on the stage. We're getting to where us as educators are becoming more of a guide on the side. And in that, uh, the scenarios help to do that because it engages the learners in it. And like I said, it works. That's what scenarios are, are all about. So here's the beer. I promised you guys beer. And I think we still got a few minutes. We can uh, take some additional questions and you might want to drink this beer because our sources are considerably longer. So we'll go through those and take any questions that you guys may have at this point. And one thing that uh, I forgot we failed to mention was we do have a, uh, the National Registry has some scenario guides for building scenarios uh, that they have. Uh, we have one that we use that is uh, similar to it. It includes a lot more uh, detailed information uh, that uh, it, we can provide. Uh, our My email address is on here. If you would be interested in that, I'll be more than happy to share that uh, scenario setup with you as well. Anything else that we have. Um, you can you can build scenarios. Uh, you can build virtual scenarios starting out with PowerPoint. PowerPoint has uh, some features in it that will allow you to uh, build scenarios. But uh, when you get to the online learning side of things, uh, you can the scenarios have a couple of different. There's really two primary different ones. There's a, a straight scenario, and then there's also uh, what's called a branching scenario. 
and the branching scenarios are the ones where the learners come in uh, one door and then there's multiple doors that they can go out versus a, a, a linear scenario. So um, just a couple of different things that you can run into when you're uh, looking at those and, and building out uh, your own scenarios. But again, we're here, we're available, be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, it's our contact information is here and I will pass it over to David. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure for us to share what we know with you and hopefully you can take away uh, something from this, whether it's something as simple as a small piece of this, or if you want to go out there and uh, fully adopt a, a, a nice robust suite of scenarios. Well, thank you so much, Kelly and David. Uh, so far, I haven't seen any of the questions coming through. Um, I'll give it just a few more minutes, but um, thank you so much for all the information that you shared today. And thank you everyone for joining us today. This webinar will be posted on careercert.com later, as well as some of our past free resources. So please visit us there to learn more about scenario-based education. Are there any last questions? Okay, great. It doesn't look like it. So thank you again. And please feel free re to reach out to our team at CareerCert or to David and Kelly. Again, we are more than happy to answer any questions that you might have and to help your team streamline your education and continuing and uh, training. Thank you again for connecting with us today and thank you for your sacrifices to make our communities safer places. Take care.